for another thing. But I would like to just give, start off by telling you how my story is related to designing business models and my journey. And then I will tell you uh, and towards what types of things you want to avoid and what types of things you want to accommodate. Uh, now, when I started, I started, uh, I didn't have much job experience. Um, I came back in 2013 to Bahrain and I decided to do a model for virtual medical consultations. Now, we got it down to we 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 got it down perfectly. We dotted the I's. Uh, we were even one of the first to pilot an insurance program to cover doctors practicing medicine online. And uh, now this was in 2013. My first challenge was that when I went to the Ministry of Trade, they said no, this is a Ministry of Health related issue. I went to a Ministry of Health and they said you have no doctors. Go back to the Ministry of Trade. Now, back when I started, there's no eco there was no ecosystem. It was at the start of the ecosystem, the support system for startups. Um, so there wasn't much change into accommodating technology um, at the time. So this is something that has added value to, to you yourself. Um, but I decided to start anyway. Um, I hired a firm, they established the company, everything was good. But the problem is when I went to my customers and I said, this is what I have, a holistic solution that will transform your business and the way you work as medical practitioners. I, they come to realize that this is something they don't, they didn't comprehend, was not accepted at the time here in the area. Um, and what happened was they were asking me the questions, but they were asking me wrong questions. Um, instead of asking me, how do I sign up? What is the cost? So basically my revenue model. They were asking me who built the platform um, and because we built it and we designed it uh, i would say it was myself and my team now the problem here is they were not interested in using my platform they wanted to build something of their own and this was a very big challenge for me because i was trying to push something yeah. and they were trying to give me back something else that i did not want to sell and i did not even consider at the time um, but what I then realized is that if I wanted to keep a business sustainable, I would need to generate multiple revenue options. That being said, a few months in, closely towards a year, I decided, you know what? I'm running out of cash and this is something I need to do. I have the ability, I have the power, let me go ahead and do that path. And that's when we started developing for customers. Okay. About 18 months in, we, I was still stubborn. We still had struggle trying to convince the region of this medical platform. Um, what happened was we then realized, you know what, it's not profitable. I then realized in order for me to become a profitable business, I would need to set aside my wants and put in front of me my needs, yeah. right? So I wanted this idea to thrive, but then I realized that it's not the idea that is profitable, it's a business. Yeah. So that's the, that, this is what every time, so over the years I, I meet with startups on a daily basis and I tell them if a business is not profitable, then it's defined as a charity. So, so if, if it does not generate revenue, then it's defined as a charity um, or a non-profit. But, but coming back to that, we put that aside and I said, you know what? We're not getting any progress. No one's trying to understand. It's taking too much for me to just explain the idea. Yeah. Then why don't I just do this and see where this takes me? I have the team. I have the experience. Um, I didn't get, I didn't get experience with working with other organizations. No, I got it the hard way because I was the one trying to struggle and get that experience myself. So if this option would fail, I'll go try the other, try another option. And it was persistence that made put me through, but. At the end of the day, it was my stubbornness that held me back. Now, now we started taking that path. With time, uh, we gained more experience. My team grew. And I saw that this side was the profitable side. But what I then realized, that my passion was not for medical technology. It was to solve the challenges that people face and to bring in innovative solutions and design something like that. Yeah. So across the years, we've, we've become the go-to for things kind of out of the box. If you if you have if you have an objective 
but you don't know how to get through it through technology or enhance it or streamline your workflow through technology, this is where we come in place. Yeah. And because of the experience we have on multiple projects, and some of them are not um, standard in nature, uh, that we 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 managed to put together inside and out how different businesses because I uh, because in my case technology is not an industry it's horizontal every industry has technology banking and finance construction retail there's the it's so it, it marks across the experience all of that but to finalize just this point if I was stubborn and I continue to be stubborn and I wasn't adapt adaptive to and my multiple revenue stream. The first telemedicine uh, organization that was licensed. Um, so I was saying, so if if I was if I if I continued to remain stubborn and I wanted to push my idea into the market and not identify the difference between what I want and what I need, then the biggest struggle would have been that today, to the end of 2019, was the first telemedicine licensed platform so i would have had to push and struggle with no revenue for seven years until i can actually get this idea to market where people comprehend because there's a lot of liability in the medical world even if people like it they're like are you licensed and i started even before the the nahra organization was even established yeah, yeah. so 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 there's a big timing is a big position in in coming into the market with a business model and revenue streams so what looking back, I just want to highlight that my experience did change, right? But what made me successful was not the ideas, was not the stubbornness, was not the persistence, but it was my adaptability and acceptance to see opportunity, utilize what I currently have and not and not allow it to limit what I need and take it to market. Like an example for this, especially with new business startups, I see this a lot today that a lot of people come in and say, a lot of people come in and say, okay, you know what? I'm going to get this. And once I get this, then I can only sell. Once I have a team, I'll put something together. I started with no team. I started with just me going into the office. I started at home. Then I moved to the office. When I was in the office, I did not, I had zero work. I had zero work. I was a salesman. I had zero work. And when Sometimes I'd, I'd have nothing to do after 12, but I would just sit in the office until five, just in case somebody calls. You know, it was only four months after I got the office, I hired my first person, okay. right? I've been doing this for over, now I'm in my seventh year, right? Okay. That's a long time, but I genuinely, what it has taught me is not only patience, but there's a big difference between rapid growth and sustainable growth. Mm -hmm. right? You, your model is not an overnight model, right? Your model, if 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 you see if you see no change in a week, if you see no change in a month, that doesn't mean your idea failed, yeah. right? It just it just needs time to mature. You need you you need to genuinely understand that that adaptability is key, but you don't adapt every other week. Yeah. Right. You need to have your core value. You need to take that opportunity and then from that you do ad hoc services that will complement the existing model you have. Yeah. Right. Now the problem the problem I also faced was that there was a lot of feedback from people. Right. Mm. So this is what people don't tell you. This is what the books don't actually tell you. This is the actual real life example. When you take something to market, every single person will have an opinion. Yeah, every single person will have an opinion, regardless of how successful he is, or regardless of how, you know, inexperienced he is. I just want to say that don't overcredit his opinion. Mm -hmm. Right? This is your idea. The only person I look for me, I don't, gen I genuinely don't believe in competition because two people, even though they say they have the same ideas, they're uh, they're not identical. The implementation is a big key. Yeah. Right. So when you come to market and you, they they will take two different paths. Right. They will compete, but they're not the exact same businesses. They're not two of the same businesses that offer specifically the same thing. Right. So when co coming back to coming back to understanding that 
and taking it to market, putting their opinion. Don't change your idea because you feel that people, you know what, somebody gave you a good idea. You think there's more value in that than the path you're taking and you decide to change tomorrow. Because if you continue going through that path, one, you will not have your idea. Okay. Two, you're you're going on ideas that have no justification. They're just opinions. Even within technology, it's if it's something, certain functions, certain limitations, right? In, in technology, so in development, there's a term called bug or feature, right? So sometimes when we build something, okay, and and uh, something else happens, or there's something that that you would think you developed, but then naturally happens. And when the customer or yourself see it, you realize, was this done by mistake or was this done uh, as a feature? So it's, is it a bug or is it a feature, right? And if I could use that analogy into the actual business model is that not everything is justified, right? You, you go in, you go in and things will change, right? You turn, you, 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 you sell your features and you turn your bugs into features. Right? So whatever that naturally happens along the way to your benefit, you utilize and you take advantage, right? Like, I'll just give you an example, like we're the development house. If I list the services that I can develop, they're endless. But if I go to someone and say, I can develop X, Y, and he says, I can develop A, if I have the capabilities of doing it, I'll say, yes, I will develop A. And I will not say, no, I'm, I stick to X and Y, and, and, unless regulation permits me, uh, then that's that's where I'll stand. Be adaptive. Your journey within is a long, long journey of change. And and when you're trying to validate initially, right? Everyone will tell you do a business plan. Yes, right. So so when you look at a business plan, there are different things you need to look at, like the streams of revenue, your channel partners, the the, the general idea, right? Don't look too much onto the execution of the plan. Not a lot of people, a lot of people, they they want to rush it to market, right? And they say, well, validation can come. Look, at the end of the day, if somebody wanted to validate anything, they can take they can take data, right? They can use it to their advantage and say, you know what, this idea is justified just to take their just to take their idea to market. It's, it's 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 the same thing when you're writing a paper in university, right? You look at you look at you look at points, you take things out of context, you put them there, you quote the author to support your argument. It's the same thing with the business model. You make it happen, right? Yeah. So so my question is, when you take the difference is with this and a, and a and in a, in a business paper is that you take this to market, right? Yeah. Now what happens if you realize you know what? I took I took uh, I took a step forward and I realized the information wasn't correct in my business plan. No one, I have never heard this excuse that, you know what, it didn't go according to my business plan. Yeah. Because no one, no one applies exactly what they did in their business plan into, into practical action, in practical. Because like you'll say, I, I'll hire two people. Now for us, in order to vet and hire, it takes me an average of two months yeah. to hire one person. So think of a startup coming in and saying, I'm going to hire someone and then he'll do the work for me. Whoever, whoever you think will do the work for you, then you're not ready to do the start. You're not ready to enter that startup world because, because when you do that, you, you, the people that, that work under you as a team, put their trust in you, yes. right? Yes. So, so you need to make sure that every decision you make, you know you will be liable for, but there is a team behind you to back you. But at the same time, know that me highlighting this shouldn't act as a setback, but it's something for you to consider as a limitation when going into market. Don't be dependent on someone else within the team. A lot of people say yes. You know, like so for me, I I, I do a lot of uh, I ask to do a lot of uh, startup uh, mentoring, right? And the biggest issue is that I think people highlight the fact that, you know what, 
I'm a designer, he's a developer, and this guy is a sales. Now we're a business, right? It's true, but to what extent, what is your idea, right? What what value do you add? What responsibilities do you hold? It's, 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 it's these, it, what I'm trying to say is these common things do not define a business or its model, okay. right? What defines a business is the idea, the ability of that person to take it to market and to understand that all revenue streams must not be open from day one. Yeah. Because if you have 10 revenue streams, then you'll need the capacity to manage the demand of 10, right? Mm -hmm. And you throw scalability out of the window because yeah. you, you leave no room for growth. Yeah. Right? You're always going to stay the same. And from practical experience, for me, when I went bigger, I realized that when I went bigger too fast, I couldn't change as fast as I went smaller with a tighter ship and a stronger team, and which allowed me to become more agile and change. Yeah. Now, coming to Evergo, so Evergo was a business um, I we officially started a year ago, and what I then realized is that, look, I want to diversify, right? Mm -hmm. But when I want to diversify, when I want to diversify, I want to diversify something that is within the lines of what I currently do. So that, yani, on a, if I can say this in Arabic, in a, on a, I'm a strong believer in الواحد مفروض ما يشتت تفكاره. On a, for me, this is the best practice I do. Whenever I feel like my mind is too busy and I cannot think or make a decision, I leave everything, I shut down. I do everything else but not work, even though if it's for two, three hours. Right? I, I do anything and everything. And when I come back, what stays in my head is what matters. Yeah. I'm a big believer that if you forget about it overnight or if you forget about it in two days' time, then it's not that important. Yeah. Like to the actual model and the position you take. That's why, like for us, for me, especially with Evergo, so now it's our experience. Because even seven years down the line, I it, it was a completely new experience for me. So I started Evergo because I realized resources and the model we put into place, I have strength in experience and I already know my team. I took people aside, we designed the model and it took us nine months to put together the technology, right? I took it to more We decided that we're going to raise raise investment. Uh, so so I, I took the value of the team, okay, and which would also reduce. And I funded the development of Evergo through Manai Tech, which is the first startup. Mm -hmm. And when before going to market, we raised money from angel investors. I said, look, I have the experience, I have the team, I have the product. Now. I need investment to take it to market. We were one of the first to get investment during COVID, right? Now, the only issue is, okay, I, I laugh at this every time. So this is me around 13 months of hard work to this point, and then you have COVID. So Evergo is a booking, so Evergo is a booking aggregator. So you book anything. So you want to book a test drive, you want to book an appointment at the bank, you want to book a saloon, you want to book a clinic, you want to book it the best. We built an engine that is universal across industry, which is something the first of its kind, right? So we take it to market. We have the money. I have, I ticked every single box in my plan, mm. right? And then COVID hit. Yeah. And on top of that, everything shut down, right? And even the people you want to go to closed. And yeah. by law, you're not allowed to leave the house. Now, I don't know. How, I I don't know how this is something anyone could have foreseen, but I don't know how. It it it, it was it, it hit me as a shock, because, you know, all this all this work and this is and I had it down to like and I dotted the eyes, yeah. and what do I do now? I need to pivot. You know, yeah. it, 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 we pivoted. Yeah. And this is this and here I realized that you know what we needed to be agile, right? 
So what our pivot was, was that, you know what? We have the power of the availability, the booking, the workflow for the businesses to manage, right? Because it, it works under multiple employees. Um, and what happened was you bring in, you bring in, uh, we brought in, uh, because I had the power of like the, the technology behind me, so I introduced a video conferencing service, right? So we ha- we brought in our own video communication. We deployed it on our servers. We built our workflow around it. So now, instead of some having a booking engine, we have something like Eventbrite and Zoom put in together. People can book appointments and the calls actually happen on Evergo. And then this is when I realized, okay, you know what? Everyone's doing this. Okay, so now I went from something completely new to something that everyone's doing. And and it only worked, I'll tell you why it only worked, because we had the workflow to manage the facility. So we were able to f- manage the, f- so every, every staff member could be at home and the business would operate as usual. So there was a, approval workflows for people to accept. Now that was not the only thing. When it came to vendors, to bring people on board, I realized, you know what? Everyone has the same vendor. So me coming and saying, hey, you want to join Evergo? They're saying, okay, why don't we join X? We're already on, we're already on Y. And the, the customer doesn't want to enter three apps for the same vendor. So I decided, you know what? Let's do something different. I went back to being the door-to-door salesman. And I, be, I went to the international brands and I knocked on their doors. I said, listen, you're, you're at home, we're at home. How about we use this opportunity to expand your customer base and your brand awareness? They said, how? I said, okay, offer sessions to people in the GCC. Okay. And what we did was we brought in fitness centers, facilities all out of London, mm-hmm. and we offered them to the GCC. So, so now we don't only have local vendors, but we're, we're the only ones in the region who have international vendors. It's and and it's 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 nonstop change in adaptability. Like if you ask me by December, was this the Evergo you designed? I'll say I don't even recognize it. And and it and 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 then now the only struggle is is that now things once we were doing good on one side, okay, and things start to open up again. So no, the question is, should I pivot or should I stay? And and technology also with technology, there's a lot of power, but there's also a lot of limitations. Right now. Should we pivot back or no? So we, what we've decided is, yes, we're going to pivot back, but we're going to bring in a holistic approach. We're going to introduce local vendors for physical bookings and international vendors for virtual booking. Okay, yeah. But yeah. and, and this the, the funny thing is, is that um, someone asked me a couple of days ago, was this part of the plan? Because like, I, I, I'm always thinking. So I'm always I always feel like I want to be three, ten steps ahead. So if this doesn't work, I'll do this. If this doesn't work, I'll do that. I said, out of the 60,000 options I thought of how Evergo would go, right? Yes. Virtual was never one of them. You know, this is this is proof that you need to stay agile. You need to understand where what your customer needs, whether they're users, whether they're businesses. And you need to understand that monetization does not come from the start, right? Monetization you can put in the nap, the general revenue streams, but monetization only will only come when you have the ability to show your customer the value. Yeah. Because nobody will put a price at something that has no value, yeah. even in retail. Right? You will not buy something in dinar if you don't feel it. Yeah. So you need to show them that, look, you can bring value to the table. And when you bring value to the table, you then negotiate how much you want, right? A lot of people say, you know what, with subscription models, I'll charge $20 a month, it's nothing. But you're not the only $20 a month I'm paying. I have 20 other subscriptions, right? Yeah. So that's $400 a month for me. So when you come to me and tell me, you know what, $20, I'll say, no, I already, I already have 400. I don't want to pay another $20. But when you come and say, you know what, this is worth the $20 I'm putting in. Here's 20, here's 30, here's 40. 
So I think the biggest takeaway of what I want to explain is that when you're coming, I, I'm, I want to look at it from a bird's eye view. When you're coming to designing a business model, think of a backup plan, right? Validate that backup plan because what COVID has taught us is that, you know, regardless of years of preparation, you know, anything can happen that will that will change the entire, you know, game. Uh, but 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 validate it only to a certain extent. So when I was when I started, I wanted everything to be perfect. Yeah, I wanted everything to be perfect, and I stuck and I I went to to uh, I I rebranded. Sorry, when I rebranded, not when I started. When I rebranded, uh, I wanted everything to be perfect. Oh, and I, on a tapped, on a tapped, finding that perfection. And uh, the person I was working with said, "Look, I'll buy a ticket. Reach 70% of being contempt. Once you will never get 100. Reach 17, you're fine." And I applied that to everything. So if it's something I can live with, fine, move on. You know, there are more important things. The color blue or green will not change the entire game. All right, I'm not Coca-Cola. But, but at the end of the day, when I started, don't think you need anything to start. My only cost was $60. I bought a domain. I only used it for email. I went to Google. I put coming soon. And I started emailing everyone saying, hey, guys, I have this service. Do you want to buy it? It's going to be ready in six months time. And it wasn't even ready. I had the idea, but I needed the money to fund the development. Um, and that's how we started slowly. And what I did, like, it, and, and, and not everyone not everyone accepted. So when the first person, the first service provider was like, this is something I'm interested in. Let's talk. We talked, we made an agreement. I went back to the guy that said, no, I said, look, hey, this supplier is coming in. Are you sure you don't want to go in? And then that brought me back into the table. Yeah. You know, so it's, 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 it's the same thing. This is how I'm getting now through the international brands, right? I only needed one or two. So when I knock on the door, I say, hey, listen, I'm working with X, Y, they're already in, they're benefiting. Look at their numbers. Do you want to work with, do you want to work with me or no? It's, it's your opportunity because I generated value not in financial currency, but I generated value in towards contributing back to them. And this is something that builds relationships between your customers and suppliers. It's a big psychological game, right? So while I was doing this presentation, they were telling me, yes, we just sold the franchise to them. And I said, so I would go to the, the other company. I'd say, hey, look, you know what? This might help you sell franchises and brand awareness. You know what I mean? I know that they're, 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 that is their aim from the campaign they're doing with us. Why don't you get bored? And they're like, yeah, this is something I need to do. And even one of the biggest, the funny thing is, one of the biggest um, we were we wanted to work with, we did the demo, we worked every, we, we worked with them. Everything was positive. After that meeting went dead silent. They don't reply to my email. They don't reply to nothing. So I was like, you know what? Move on. It was a long shot anyway, right? I come back around two weeks later while onboarding others, right? Mm -hmm. I get an email saying, hey, listen, we want to work with you. These are our terms. We're fine. Agree and let's move forward. And then with, within three days, everything set up, you know, okay. it, it, it's because it's because when you don't you, I closed the door. But what I realized is that it was a little open. They wanted to see how I would do in the market and then come back if I did good. They don't want, they didn't want me to take the risk on them. Yes. What, but what other people usually do is that they would be persistent, but try, but what if I give it to you for free? What if I give you six month free trial? What if I never took money from you? You know what I mean? If, if I can't, if I can't, if I can't utilize you, then why should you just utilize me? I just want to say these are, these are the general things that you should consider in value business model execution and looking at revenue models. These are the things that I, I experienced firsthand and none of the business plans taught me across the way. I didn't even until six months down the line, this, this, this guy told me, so you're an entrepreneur. I just said, yes, I didn't know what it meant. I went back home and I, did, I, I, I looked it up because it, the system was not there. The definition was not made public. I always advise that don't start out with commitment. So, so when, when you want to sign someone up, don't say, yes, I'll give it to you at this rate if you sign a year, mm. right? Spend that year doing pay-as-you-go. Only pay me 
when you are at value, right? So let's say if if it's an application, you take a transaction fee, right? That which means when you sell, I will only make money. Until you sell, we're not going to make anything together. Okay. Right? Because because it's easy to say in a presentation that you know what I'm going to charge them a subscription of ten dollars for a one year contract, right? But the practical aspect of it is that no one wants to commit to anything. Yeah. No yeah. business wants to tie down, especially when you're at the start stage, because when you sign up a business, you move on to the other, and then you move on to the other. You neglect the people behind you. So come four months down the line, going back to him and say, give me my $40, and they'll say, yeah, but where were you the last three months, right? So. Same thing with us. So when I went virtual, what I did was I said, don't pay me a monthly fee. Every time you have a session, pay me for that session. I will charge a minimum fee. Right. And I will give you 30 free sessions. You have nothing to lose, but everything to gain. And that is the easiest selling point you will be able to push. Right now, when looking at the nature of the model, always look at now today common what is common practice how do people charge for it look at their model right because because at the end of the day what you need to keep is your core you can't say i'll charge it in a different way no transaction fees subscription fees subscription fees are anything so if you develop something that is of a service you then you then charge them for utilizing your service as a tool for the business right if you're in the data game then you have a long way to go, okay. right? Nobody wants 500 users. Nobody wants the spending of 50,000 users, right? If you are in the data game and you want to monetize on that, then aggregate data and correlations that no one else has, right? When you show them the ability that you can generate this information and you have the traction that will lead you towards it, then there's more value to your data than, you know what, I want to know how many people order online today. You know, it, and, and something to, to, to just shed light on is that now our, our learning curve has spiked. Yes. So the people persistent to change because of COVID have changed, right? For example, I think benefit pay went up 600%. Um, some I, I, like a crazy figure like that. Um, Shahloub Group, so they they own the franchises of Saks, um, Bloomingdale's, and I and around around the GCC. Their digital transformation plan was set to 2025. Right? They hit that milestone in 2020, five years ahead, within a span of four months. Yeah. So. What's happening now is there's a shift, right? So you've been taught in, you've been taught university on consumer behavior, right? So the physical consumer behavior, but now there's a shift towards digital consumer behavior. Insights on something like that is not available in the region. You know that that then then that you can monetize from day one. But if you come and say, I'm going to see how many people buy milkshakes in Bahrain or the GCC, I'll, I'll understand something very specific or the food consumption in the GCC, tens of years, people, and been t the last tens of years, the people have been compiling that data. You're not bringing, even if you, if, even if you have a more innovative, innovative way of bringing it to the table, at the end of the day, you'll have the same end result. So don't try to put a price tag on that. So look at how the market practices and then reduce it to make it a win-win situation between you and your potential customer. Once you show value, then you monetize, then you lock in, then you say, you know what, you've been doing this for a year, your customers are used to me. You can't let go, mm. right? So if I double the price, you're fine. And this is, it, it, it's the harsh way of actually saying it, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, and it, 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 you have to make sometimes decisions in the business that not only affect yourself, but affect the people behind you and the customers you're supporting. It's not always fun and games. Like it's it, 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 it's six months of down for that one day of up. It's more of a question, Eliane. You're going to hear it and Yanni, you basically say, oh my God, not this again. No, no, uh, 
So basically, Yanni, uh, from what I've heard so far, Yanni, not just Yanni, uh, not just like working on this program, but in general, in Bahrain, anytime I ask people about like working in a startup, they always tell me in a, for example, in the first couple of months to the first year, do not expect to make any sort of profit. And then any at best, you will be breaking even. Should that be something to demotivate you or is that normal? Well, that's normal. Yeah, and you look at the end of the day, right? There's no, like how I said, that startups are not an overnight success, right? If, if you're an overnight success, then you're, you hit the jackpot, right? They're long and long and effective growth and it's slow growth that determines value right now it that's why they say startups are struggles because we don't have the money you know that's the, that's the, that's the number one reason <laughs> startups are a struggle because we generally don't have the money you know and, and we're going out there to market to generate that revenue but what i want to add is that you're not the only one on the board like if you look at Facebook, if you look at Instagram, they were not overnight successes. If you look at startups that are Slack, you might, you know, you might have discovered them now, but they've been operating for 10 years. I'll give you an example. So when do you, th- just an average question, when do you think Zoom started? Uh, I've seen, I think I've seen like uh, charts comparing Zoom, team, uh, uh, Teams and Skype. And I think I'm pretty sure Zoom started back in like 2010. So think, 10, year. area. 10 years, right? Yeah. So it took them 10 years for you to use it today. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I, I get what you mean. Yeah. And, and, to, and after only after 10 years. They were valued today more than all of the U.S. airline industries combined. Is that because of the like the airlines dropping or is Zoom that good it's now? Because of both. There's a spike in demand and then the airlines dropping as well, which paid. But but at 43 billion valuation, I think you have the right to you know to to sell that to, to to use that point. But but what I'm trying to say is that like. I, I've accepted that, you know, there are people in Bahrain that might not know about ever go until 10 years time. And that's fine. As long as I'm doing what I'm doing, right? I, I push through the struggle and I'll just, I'll just give you an example, right? So, um, so what I did was to reduce costs. So I still have the investment, right? So I said, I, ha- I brought something to monetize. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm in not, I'm not in a revenue generating stage now. And until mid next year, I don't expect to get any money, right? Even if I get any money, that money won't change me, right? It, it, it won't make me expand to, to take down uh, bigger offices, hire a team of 30, no. But what I did was I utilized the months where, you know what, we developed enough and now it's us taking it to market, training people on what we have, utilizing. The developers, I shift back to Manartec. come on Manitex payroll, right? So what, what that allows me is that from, from the resources I have, I monetize, I cover the costs, allow me to burn, you know? So I actually have a fluctuating burn rate. 